The guest I'm about to interview today produces the best review content I've ever seen from a small publisher. He has a very in-depth review process that makes his content truly incredible. And Google seems to agree because while most of the industry went down with the recent helpful content update, the broad core updates and the spam updates, his main site, naplab.com, went up significantly. So I think there's something to learn from Derek today. Especially because he's evolving in one, if not the most competitive affiliate niche out there, the mattress niche. It's a niche that pays hundreds of dollars per affiliate sale and therefore there are some very very strong competitors against him. Sites like Sleep Foundation which is a DR89 site or sites like Sleepopolis which is a DR74 site that he used to own but I'm not gonna go into that story today, look it up though. All of that to say that Derek's achievement with NapLab.com is very impressive because the site is only DR34 and he barely does any link building at all. He gets all of his traffic from the quality of his content and no it's not topical authority, we're talking a lot about it during the interview. One thing that I was particularly interested in is how Derek builds his review process. So I spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the process he has to build a review process so that you can do the same thing on your website. But while this business model is fully legit and by the book when it comes to Google's review recommendations, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. And while I hope this episode will inspire a lot of you guys to go the legit route and do real reviews and do better websites in general, I wanted to also share the frustration that can be felt by Derek when Google fails to recognize the effort he puts into his content and ranks some generic shitty websites above him. So we spent quite a bit of time talking about that, how Google has been changing with the recent updates and what the future looks like. Before we get started, I want to thank today's sponsor, Search Intelligence. We'll tell you more about them and how they can help you acquire legit links through high quality PR campaigns a bit later in this episode. But for now, let's get started with the interview. So Derek, who are you? What do you do? And how do you stand out from your average affiliate marketer? Well, my, my name is Derek Hales. I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am a professional product reviewer. I, I test products. I, I write about them. I do videos about them. We do comparisons, best of lists. And we publish all this content to, to our websites and into our channels on YouTube. Yeah. So what makes you different from the average marketer? You haven't answered about that. I think I am uh, a bit of a perfectionist and maybe a bit insane when it comes to <laughs> the the level of quality that I expect from from myself and I expect from from my team, you know, we we go hard on on everything we review. And I think as you know, sort of as a smaller mid sized reviewer, you have to. That's the only way to get seen. There, there's there's so much competition in it, almost every like product review space that if uh, if we don't take it to just this ridiculous level of quality and everything that we do and objectivity, we will never get seen. And so I think really that's probably the thing that makes our our, our process uh, the most different. Yeah, I think so. I think that's why I wanted to have you on the podcast because I actually quoted your site. Uh, actually, you're going to have to talk about your sites next, but like I've quoted your site several times in this podcast as like, here's how you guys should do reviews. I mean, it should be an inspiration at least on like how to do review as a small publisher because it's quite easy to point out websites like The Verge, etc., like big, big, big publishers and be like, oh, just do yeah. that. It's like not necessarily realistic for uh, small publishers, but I think you have been someone that has kind of like nailed down that formula for at a level that many people can reach provided they, like it, it's still an effort, but like many small publishers could reach provided they actually walk in that direction. But can you tell us a little bit about your sites, what they are and how well they're doing? Sure. So I have, uh, I have two sites that my team and I run. Uh, the, one of them is uh, naplab.com. At NapLab, we are exclusively focused around mattresses. So we test them, review them, comparison, best of lists. Then we have educational content to help support and explain what we're doing as well. And then we have moderncastle.com. So Modern Castle is sort of all things home. Uh, over the years, we've we've tested a number of different sort of you know product categories to see you know sort of what made sense and and what our readers were really interested in seeing. And really, we've settled into kind of th expensive things that clean around the home has been kind of where Modern okay. Castle has landed. So vacuums, robots, air purifiers, stuff like that. Yeah, it's like I, I've I've checked a lot of your vacuum cleaner pages. I remember your tests, etc. And actually, that's kind of like what I want to talk about. Like you've teased that you were. Uh, a very perfectionist, like very perfectionist in your content, etc. Can you give us an idea to what extent you test the products and what kind of like stuff you show on your site when you review them and how it differentiates you from any other reviewers? So when when it comes to our tests, you know, I'm a big believer in as, as much objective and quantifiable content as possible. That that type of content just it allows you to stand out in a way that you really otherwise couldn't. 
uh, and, and it's sort of this sea of sameness where people, you know, sort of review a product and it's like 1500 words and it's lots of stock images. We try to be as far from that as possible. So um, our, our process really begins with, with an in-depth test and that test can take anywhere from a day to a day and a half to, to several days of just testing the product. And so over the years, we've developed a, a battery of objective and data-driven tests. So we take the product, you know, let's say something like, you know, a robot vacuum, you know, we're going to run a cleaning test, a pet hair test, a long hair test, a crevice test, an edge test, a navigation test, an obstacle test, all of these different things that are important to someone that's you know, ready to buy a robot vacuum. And we then have all of this like, library of data, then we can then compare that versus other products that we've tested, we've done the same test for, and we can then definitively say, okay, this product performed 15% better in this test or 5% worse in this test. So it's maybe better if you have, you know, pets or it's better if you just need something that is totally hands off. Uh, and we can make those recommendations in a way that has actual data and evidence behind it. So I think that probably is the, the biggest thing that, that differentiates us. Yeah, you field test everything. Like you don't just read the Amazon product description and, and write, uh, write something about this. So like the Amazon reviews or something. Exactly, exactly. We, we try, almost try to avoid reading anything else about the product because I don't want it to, to, to push me in a different direction or make me you know, think a certain way. So, you know, we just go in blind and, you know, let our experiences and our tests drive what we say about a product. Yeah, okay. I want to definitely one of the part of this interview is going to be diving deep into like your review process because I think that's one of the most interesting things about your business. Um, but I, you probably know about this, but Google cares a lot about EEAT these days, like experience, uh, expertise, authority, and trust. And so what, like you review mattresses, for example, what makes you a qualified mattress reviewer in the eyes of Google? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, when, when I started I in 2014, I, I certainly wasn't, you know, I was just a guy that needed a new mattress, had gone through the experience of, you know, going into a store and, and researching products online to try to find something that felt like it was going to work. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the years, I think we've we've developed, you know, with the, the things that Google wants with their, with their eat algorithm. And so I, mean, I think our experience is just the, the number of years. I, mean, I started testing mattresses in, in 2014. And then the last, you know, nearly 10 years, we've tested close to 300 different mattresses from over 70 different brands. Um, with that level of just sheer quantity of products that we've, we've had through and we, we've done these objective tests around, you know, I think we've established ourselves as an authority, just given the sheer number of mattresses that we've, we've seen come through. And as far as trust, I mean, I think that's such a, a hard one to like stamp down, like what is a trusted source? It's one of those things I think when you see a website, you immediately know, like, this, this website has the right information and is structured in the right way and the branding is the right way that I, I trust what they're, they're going to say. And so I think so many of those trust signals come from so many different aspects of our website, how we structure, how we test, how we research, how we disclose the level of transparency that we provide. And so we really try to put all that out there and just, you know, let, you know, our, our readers and our viewers, you know, just know as much about us as we can, and then they can make their, their own decision on whether or not they think that we are a viable and valuable source of information. Yeah, I think the expertise is just displayed through the sheer amount of pages with unique insights on the site, basically, uh, the experience rather. Uh, and I think for me, like the trust is like, you know, when I buy an expensive product, it's like, I read like, 25 reviews or something like you know i read like every single yeah. page about this like whatever i buy a new camera or i buy like a new phone or something i go crazy of like the benchmarks etc and what makes me trust the site is when they display something original and different like some kind of like field test some kind of like new data etc you know it's like you know did they test the, the the 5g speed on the new iphone before i ordered it so that i know like which one is compared to yeah. like the last models or something is there a graph that shows me like the evolution over time or things that were not necessarily said in a keynote or something like this that would be something that uh, i would personally trust and i think it's like creation of unique insights from the side of google so it's like they're like indexing large amounts of data and then it's like if they find something unique that they haven't found somewhere else with a context of like real testing so it's like for example, in our course, we teach people that if you want your site to feel real, you need to express the limitations of your testing. So it's like you, you say, oh, maybe I didn't have access to a full range of product or there's different things, etc. I can say that. Whereas fake reviews yeah. tend to not acknowledge any of that, for example. 
um, that would be like one way that Google would be looking at this from like a semantic point of view, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. Your your your, your comment around spec reviews in particular, I think, is such a an interesting one because I think that is such a large percentage, particularly historically, of how like reviews are done. You know, they just look at the spec page, and look at the details, and then they you know write some stuff and pull some stock images and from the product page. Yeah, yeah. And that is just wholly insufficient for you know the vast majority again like small and mid sized reviewers. You know, if you're if you're Forbes or Wirecutter, sure you can get away with shenanigans like that. But for everybody else, you know, you have to to go hard uh, on, on your tests and your data provides something that is is new and valuable. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's what you're doing really well with your site. Now, you you know, there's been a bunch of Google updates re re really recently. There's been the helpful content update. There's a core update rolling out. There was one two months yeah. ago and there's a spam update right now. Like that's that's where we are at, where we're recording this podcast is gonna come maybe a bit after these updates. Um, but a lot of stuff has happened. Nap Labs done really well in the recent updates from what I've seen on Ahrefs. Do you feel like Google does a good job rewarding high experience content these days? Or do you feel like it's still not enough? That's a great question. I, I think in general, yes, that's their aim. But, but clearly the fact that we're getting this number <laughs> of updates shows that Google's not happy with the algorithm. Mm -hmm. The users are probably generally not happy with the algorithm. So I think they have, have a long way to go. Um, you know, I think in general, I, we've always felt like we're, we're making that type of content stuff that, that Google should love, stuff that users love, and yet it always doesn't get rewarded. And so, um, you know, I think NapLab, you know, since the launch, we've had a really steady increase. And then this, the most recent few updates we've, we've done really well on. Uh, so it seems like Google's finally, like, you know, acknowledging, oh, this is a good site. We like this. Users like this. Um, whereas Modern Castle has had a, a roller coaster. I mean, we had a very sort of steady that, increase yeah. for about three years. And then in the last three years, it's been a roller coaster. We've been kind of all over the place and we've definitely got some some work to do and some improvements on that site. Um, you know, one of the things on, on Modern Castle, we we had, you know, objective data-driven testing as we started the site, but not nearly to the absurd level that NapLab has done. And so we are now there, yeah. in the process of essentially retesting every major product and brand that we've done over the years with a, a revamp series of just like ridiculously focused data-driven test for every every product and we have we're covering six major product categories so we essentially have a dedicated unique system for each of those and i think it, it's that process that in the long run is going to be able to allow modern castles to sort of like step up to, to that level and hopefully get a little bit more consistency with the trajectory and kind of get off the the roller coaster a little bit yeah but like the thing is like yeah i you can see that definitely it's like it's more a matter on modern castle than it is on that lab at this point and i see you're trying to like catch that up basically but still like do you feel like the people who outrank you on modern castle do a better job than you or, or is google not there no yet? no def <laughs> and that's definitely my question. Not. i mean there there is maybe you know one site that routinely outranks us that i think is kind of at our level or you know hmm. Honestly, probably probably better than us. You know, so much of the content, and particularly on Modern Castle, without ranks, is just like this is not good. Like, how how is how is this here? And uh, yeah, it's it's definitely frustrating when you see sites that you know. It's it's one thing if, if Wirecutter or Forbes outranks you. It's another thing if job, some yeah. you know you know shady you know blog that's doing you know some sort of weird link building tactic and. They, you know, got in Google's good graces in the last update, and then they'll hold that position for six months for really no good reason other than that Google is not always the best at uh, identifying those types of pages, I think. Yeah, I think that's what's quite frustrating. It's like if, if Google was like more consistent in identifying this kind of content, then I'd see a lot more people going that route. But like seeing your like modern castle trajectory, which is still way better than most competitors in terms of testing, etc., not being rewarded on the level it should uh felt like it feels like you know a lot of like gray hat people will use that as an argument to not do good content basically and it's like that's the problem with google is like if they create these incentives then people act in a certain way and if they actually figure this out people will yeah. act in another way and it's like it's like i'd love to see sites like yours you know overtake the large media conglomerates that do not do the testing and just make like a slap a quick 10 top 10 list of products but they're dr90 uh and it's like it's not always they're not always doing a good job at that. So it's like, in a way, uh, it, when they're more consistent, I can see more people switching to that. But right now, 
I can see why people are complaining about that. And I think it's interesting because I didn't want to position this interview as like, oh, just, you know, everything Derek does is absolutely perfect and you should drop everything you do and do that. It's oh, like, we want to also... Def definitely not. We have, I think you're doing a good... We have made a lot, a lot of mistakes learn, over the years. There's a lot to learn, but I also wanted to position that as a way of like, you know, Google still has a long way to go. It looks like they're trying to take steps in that direction, but to be frank, it still leaves a lot to be desired, I think. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally fair. Yeah, it Google... <laughs> They're, they're, they're improving, and yet we, we do have a ways to go. Um, I'm I'm hopeful. I, I think Google wants a, a search ecosystem that rewards the types of, you know, data-driven objective reviews that we create. I mean, they have their entire, you know, review guidelines that explicitly yeah. state that. So you, you would think that's direction <laughs> that you go. And yet you still see, you know, big sites and, and sometimes even smaller mid-sized sites somehow sneaking into the rankings in places that feel like they shouldn't be there. Yeah. No, knowing that, like, would you recommend people all following your footsteps in terms of like quantitative testing, et cetera? Like, how do you feel about, about where things are going? And like, now that you've been doing that for a while, like, would you say it's for everyone or would you say it's just like, it's, it's part of it, I feel is like a bit of your personality as well. Like, that's what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think, you know, my personality naturally has gravitated towards this direction. I'm, you know, definitely a super nerd and I love, I love the data. I love the, the objectivity. I, I love how we're able to then craft a review that isn't opinion based as much. It is, we, we have opinions, of course, but they are strongly supported by objective evidence and so it allows products. us that that too but you know it's tough to say if this is the right approach for for every reviewer every every niche i there's certainly i think some niches where objective data just it doesn't make sense you know if you're reviewing a travel experience i don't know what you could do or if you're re reviewing you know a, a piece of you know designer clothing or handbags you know stuff that really is more subjective and just doesn't necessarily have this sort of universe of like objective tests that sort of orbit around it. I think when there is an opportunity for objectivity and for some sort of, you know, quantifiable test, I think it's really valuable. Even if you can't do it, you know, in the most like insane way possible, any level of that objectivity is going to, I think, just give more teeth to your review. And so when you say that this is best, this is mid, this is worse. People believe those recommendations. Cool. Uh, I want to dive into how you do reviews. I mean, one of my goals is really to convince people that doing legit reviews is the way to go because I feel like too many people are just totally writing what's on Amazon. Uh, and I want to help as many people as possible switch to that with this interview. But before we jump into this, I want to have a quick word about our sponsor, Search Intelligence. What a crazy campaign. How to sleep on your back. This campaign got us links in Huffington Post, Glamour Magazine, Mirror, and lots of other great news publications. Let me show you how we've done it. It was so simple. Our sleep client provided us with expert commentary about how to train yourself to fall asleep on your back. They also gave advice on why it's best to sleep on your back. Once we've had this information, we went to Muckrack and searched for journalists that consistently write about sleep and well-being. We've sent these journalists the advice provided by the client and within one day, the links started flowing in. Glamour Magazine, a DR81 website, picked it up. Huffington Post, DR88, Mirror UK, DR90, a massive avalanche of links blasted through our client's website with this simple yet effective campaign about how to sleep on your back. I hope this inspires and I hope you'll use this technique to land massive links to your or your client's website. Thanks again to today's sponsor, Search Intelligence. If you need a partner to help you grow your link profile with high quality PR campaign, then head over to searchintelligence.co.uk. And now back to the interview. So let's go back to how you do reviews. Do you buy and get your hands on every single product mentioned on your site? Uh, so a good portion we buy and a good portion gets sent to us for free by the, by the brands and the various marketing agencies that want us to test and, and cover those products. Uh, but I will say everything on the site now we are testing. If we cannot physically touch it, test it, photograph it, video it, we're, we're not going to test it. So I guess I imagine like 
how much time do you spend for like reviewing a product, time and money do you spend to review a product and then actually put the content together, take the photos, do the, you do videos as well, et cetera. Like how much does it, how much time does it take to like review a single product and do a roundup as well? Because I think these are two very different types of content. Definitely. So as far as standalone reviews go, we can do those in as quick as a few days, or some of those may take us as long as, as a full week. And that includes testing photographs, videos, script writing, writing the contextual page, editing, you know, back and forth across our team. So there's a, 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 a lot of steps and process that, that goes into that. Um, of course, you know, simple products, you know, are going to take us less time versus something that's, you know, more complicated and, and and just requires more testing is going to take us, you know, notably more time. As far as, you know, wrap up content, whether it's sort of like comparisons or best of content, um, those two generally end up being anywhere from several days to up to a week to produce that type of content. And again, it just really depends on the, the type of content if we need to do any updated testing. Uh, but fortunately, a lot of the heaviest of the lifting for, you know, a best of, you know, piece of content like, on the take, reviews, like yeah. it's already done and so mm. our our best air purifiers you know 2023 you know contextual page and video they have just a mountain of information in them but that mountain has been like slowly built over over years and years of consistent testing and so it definitely the the, the process to the test uh and sort of you know aggregate all of our data into you know a single sheet that you know we can quickly access and, and analyze is, is tedious and time consuming, but once you have that sort of library, it makes you know writing comparisons and best loves um, not only so much higher quality, but relatively so much faster than they would be otherwise. Yeah, since you have this quantitative scoring, like you tend to put like you can put the scores against each other and then be like, oh, like best for these, best for that, etc. So your way of doing the review uh, helps with that, but obviously it's pretty expensive, I imagine. Like if you're paying people salaries, like it's like a single piece of content like can often be in this, like multiple thousands of dollars, especially if you count the products, et cetera. So how do you decide what content to produce? Like I guess the way you do keyword research and all that is, is a little bit different from the people who don't really review the products. And like, how do you decide, ah, oh, this is worth it and this is not worth it uh, when you see products, basically. So, so much of our sort of process to that end is still just trying to identify what it is that consumers are mostly interested in. And that usually is where we focus more of our time. So, you know, I still use Google's keyword planner to, to check in on, you know, product names and, and, uh, review, you know, keywords as well. And product name plus review generally is what we're looking for. And, if a product has, you know, a ton of search volume, you know, we're going to focus on that. And if it doesn't, you know, even if it's, you know, you know, potentially, you know, a good product, we don't generally spend as much time on those because ultimately we're, we're trying to focus on the things that our, our, our readers and our viewers want to see the most. Like that is really job, job number one. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so say you received a brand new mattress from Satva. They like released the brand new model. Like there's no previous model, etc. That came out. They're sending you the product. What's your review process? How does it How does it work? What are the step by step things that you do actually do to actually get the review out? Sure. So uh, the first thing we do is we we test it. We get that into our, our studio or our lab. I have our, our full battery of objective and J driven tests on mattresses that we perform. Um, so we do all of our testing. At the same time, we're also doing can you give some our... ideas of what the tests are like so that people get an idea of what you're doing if they haven't seen your site sure so if anybody wants to see the the super in-depth we have like incredibly detailed explanations of every little thing we do but we do you know uh, cooling we do motion transfer we do edge support tests uh, and seven other tests and with each of these tests we try to have a you know, quantifiable measurable data to go along with it so in the case of a cooling test you know, we have thermal imagery where we are, I lie on the task, the, the mattress for 15 minutes, let it get hot, get off of it, take, you know, a series of photographs to say, okay, here's how it's releasing heat, or here's how it's not releasing heat. With something like motion transfer, we use you know, an accelerometer on one side of the mattress, and we're, we're dropping a medicine ball from a consistent height, consistent weight, and then we see how does that uh, impact the accelerometer. So we can say, okay, well, this one got this, you know, uh, meters per second squared, you know, rating on the accelerometer. And so it is, you know, so much better or worse than, you know, others that had less or more. Um, similar stuff with edge support where we are, you know, sitting, lying on the mattress and taking profile photographs 
um, and then measuring those either we have some tests we measure with an actual yardstick that like sits up aside and then some tests where we have you know uh, our, our medicine ball on there which i know the exact weight or exact height of and the exact height in pixels so that and i can say okay this it, it's 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 just you know 14 percent below my visible height meaning it has a sinkage of you know 1.9 inches and so i essentially devised this um battery of tests so that we can get this sort of quantifiable information during our testing and so that really is the sort of beginning of the the review process for mattresses uh, on app lab is all of the the tests um once we've completed those we're at the same time we're really kind of taking photographs and we're doing short video clips as well for the contextual review we get all of this this data all of these photographs all these sort of video clips uh then those go over to uh my content manager who does the the actual analysis and so he is you know going into to photoshop going into uh, premiere uh, going into some of our other, you know, testing tools to get the actual data and then dropping that into our sheets. Um, he gets all of his work done, comes back to me, uh, and then I write the the final analysis based on all of the, the completed objective data um, that we have then got in our, our sheet. We see how that compares to others that we've tested previously, uh, and then that allows us then to complete the, the final contextual review. Okay, that's a pretty thorough process. I think what's quite important is like you clearly, you know, a product comes in, you already have the list of tests you're going to do. You're not just trying to figure it out every time a new mattress comes in. And I think that's something that people uh, need to work on, which is some kind of like standardized testing so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they create a piece of content. Now, that is so, so, so critical. I think having a established, proven system of tests um, and sections within a review that every time you're going to test the product in these ways and you're going to write about these sections and you're going to write about these comparisons because that's the only way I think that you can really build that expertise over time because you are doing the same stuff on the same products every time in the same way um, and it just allows you to create again not only a review but then subsequent additional pieces you know comparison best of whatever based on this just consistent and proven process that you've built. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about right now. It's like not just the process of reviewing a product, but the process of building your process to review products. Uh, so let's imagine, you know, what? that's the interesting part for marketers, right? Uh, uh, yeah. And it's like, let's imagine that we're starting to review smartwatches. So that's my Apple Watch. There's a bunch yeah. of them. There's like, you know, the Fitbits, there's like uh, Garmin, I think, there's uh, Withings, there's like a lot of brands that, that do uh, smartwatches. I, I understand you don't know the product category very deeply, but based on what you know about that category, how would you come up with test ideas to test smartwatches if I wanted to start doing something similar to what you do? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, that's a great question. So if I was going to jump into to smartwatches, I mean, uh, for, for something like this, you know, I don't, it's a tech product. And I think tech products attract a type of enthusiast and a consumer that is even more interested in the data and the testing and expect even even more so the, the i would definitely look to sort of the the broader universe of other reviewers and competitors in the space see see what sort of tests they're doing because i suspect that some of the tests would be extremely precise in the way that instruments were used to to measure that so whether you're talking about you know battery life or runtime on the on the device or some of the the different you know, actual like technology in the device itself. Like, it, does it does it have an accelerometer in it, and like, how does that that compare? Does it have you know temperatures? How does that compare to like others in space? So there's likely all these different sensors and pieces of hardware within the device that have some type of thing that you could test, measure, and quantifiably record for each of those. With respect to the display. Um, there is a lot of uh, testing that could potentially go into displays, whether it's you know, tablets or monitors, but even like the display on a watch. So, you know, beyond just, you know, resolution and refresh rate, DPI and all that type of stuff, you know, you're looking at, you know, contrast ratio and, and how, you know, crisp are, uh, you know, those, those images playing back if you're, you know, watching videos or, or something like that on your phone. So um, that's sort of where I would begin. It's, it's such a, a hard thing to just answer right at the cut because it is yeah. such a, a technical product. But I think when you are doing any type of technical product or electronic product, your sort of your level of testing has to be even higher because the level of scrutiny is is so high. Um, 
and, and to some degree that's true with, with any sort of you know enthusiast product i think things that are fun everybody wants to write about smart watches are fun phones so are fun tablets are yeah. fun exactly so they require again just an incredible level of of execution to to break through i agree it's probably one of the hardest product categories like that's why i love tech but that's why i don't have a tech site because it's just first of all you need to update all the time like literally you're just running after the, the technology and second yeah. of all the level of competition is insane but i think yeah on my end i think what would be very interesting to test here is more the accuracy of these things. So, you know, they have like blood oxygen measurement, they have ECGs, they have all of that. So, you know, go take a medical ECG and then have your watch at the same time and <laughs> compare the evaluations yes. and et cetera. Like that would be interesting, for example, and then do that on several people with several ages or whatever, like something like that. Like, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a challenging one to do, but I think it gives ideas to people if they want to actually get into reviews, like how do I go and build like a battery of tests for a product category? Uh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I, I think if I could just offer one other piece of, of wisdom sort of building your own process is like, understand that it, it's going to take time and it, it's going to need layers of refinement. So um, as I said kind of earlier, we're in the process of really doing this right now on, on Modern Castle. And when we started it, I kind of, I thought it would take us about a month. Um, and I, we, we that's definitely I uh, underestimated just how much time was going to go into. I thought, well, I already did this on on Nap Lab, which the Nap Lab system took me about six months uh, to build, and then like six months of like continuous refinement. But uh, then I was thinking, oh, Modern Castle, I, I already I already know the tests, I know the products. This will be easy. It was and it was anything but. So we are, I think, approaching month four. We are finally in sort of like our refinement stage where. We've set a, a system of tests for each of our major product categories. We, we've actually done all those tests multiple times now. We've, we've found the issues. Sometimes, you know, we'll do a test and we'll have a particular data point that, you know, creates a certain score. And then that score feels too generous or too harsh. And so then we have to adjust the way that that yeah. metric impacts the score, which then anything that's already published has to get adjusted. So um, doing that refinement earlier is better and just i think being really harsh kind of on on yourself and like at, ask yourself you know think of like the worst you know most aggressive mean youtube commenters like those are the people we need to convince and if i can you know create a system of, of tests and scoring that even like the harshest commenter can't really say a whole lot about then i know okay this this test holds up it is it is valid it is proven um, and even at the extremes, like what we're saying about this makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I like that. It's like, I, you, you want your, you want your own Karen or, you know, post it on Reddit. I think that's the best thing to do. It's like, go on Reddit and post yeah, about right. that and then see what people are going to say. <laughs> I yeah. think that's the best, uh, the best feedback you can get. Another like kind of like complaint from site owners that want to be product reviewers, want to do it the legit way, but you know, complain about like the difficulty of it is the economy of it, right? It's like, oh, I have to buy all these products, etc. How does it work for you? Like how, like you said you're getting a bunch from brands and we'll talk about that in a minute, but like for those that you buy, how does it work? Do you resell? What do you do there with them after? Do you get any money back? Like how does it work? You're, you're, I think this is probably the most challenging part. I think really almost with, with any site, it's it's the momentum. Once you get the ball rolling, everything is easier. But getting the ball rolling is hard. When we started Modern Castle in 2017, we're a new site. We have no traffic. Nobody wants to talk to us. Nobody wants to look at us. So mm -hmm. it it was on us. You know, in our first year, I think we spent you know a little over twenty thousand dollars. You know, buying vacuums and robots, and that was just that was just the only way to do it. Like we need this stuff. We need to test it. We need to understand it. You know, Dyson and Roomba and Shark, they don't want to send us this stuff because they don't know who we are, and it, yeah, right, rightly so. Um, but, you know, as we, you know, built momentum in that first, you know, year, 18 months, you know, very, pretty quickly, you know, we start gaining tra traction, we start gaining traffic, and, you know, then you start to see, you know, brands, you know, want you to review their stuff. You know, they're looking for e exposure, they, they want the reviews, and so they're more willing to, to send the product. So I think really just getting going is the first step but i think you should be realistic that to get going is very likely going to cost a, a significant sum of money and so like any business that gets started i just sort of view it as a Investment, capital yeah. expenditure like we we need like these are as essential to the review as you know 
the copywriters and the, and the testers and the photographers are. And so you just have to have the product to, to really do, do it right. Um, as far as, you know, reselling the products, I, I'm sure you could do that. And I know a lot of reviewers do. Um, we made the decision to, to mostly hold on to most of our stuff. One, I like having it for updated tests. Two, I like having it for, you know, comparisons. Three, I like having it for our best stuff lists. And so even though we have, you know, we we're doing you know, our, our tests, we have all that data gathered. It's really nice to still be able to, you know, pull these products back out in case we have to do anything, you know, update down the road. Um, and it's also um, super valuable for just the visual. Um, you know, once a year we do, you know, best of, you know, on all the major product categories. And so we, we pulled all of our products back out. Usually I'm pulling those out into our, our driveway at this point because we have so many. I just got like I was rows gonna ask, and like, rows. Do you have and... like 20 robot vacuum cleaners? Oh my God. Yeah. Way more. It's... Way more. I th I, <laughs> Can you do I a race today... one day? Like which one's the fastest? Or just, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in the, so, somewhere in the YouTube, uh, you know, Chronicles, I've got some the really uh, almost cringeworthy, I typed those the memeable robot moments um, where we're doing some like robot Olympics, which is bad. Yeah, but, that'd be uh, fun. <laughs> um, but the, you know, having the, 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 photo, the photograph is, is important because it immediately establishes you as an authority. Like at a minimum, this person has all of these products. And so I think we have, we've tested a little over a hundred different robot vacuums to date. And I still have, you know, something like, 70 or 75 of That's them crazy. um just you know in storage in, in our garage and so I, I think um if you can hang on to them i think there is some value but if you you know as you're getting going you know it may make more sense to to try and resell those on you know craigslist or ebay and uh, if they're you know generally you know new products you know you should still be able to get a good chunk of the money back yeah, yeah. I, I guess, especially if you're getting started and you're like short on cash flow, I think it's like, it's one of the things to do. It's like, first your content, create your media. And then after that, like have your quantitative scoring. So it's like, you don't necessarily need to retest on the same test, probably you don't update your tests, I guess. Uh, yeah. And then hopefully you get to be able to compare even though you don't have your hands on the product anymore. I wanted to kind of like put you in the shoes of like an average podcast listener who's been an average affiliate marketer for a few years, they review products, but they, 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 they don't really buy the products, et cetera. They've been trashed by the recent round of updates. They lost 60% of traffic. Let's imagine that. And you want to go forward and you're like, no, I'm done. I'm listening to this podcast with Derek. I want to do this properly. Where do you get started? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think step one has to be authentic tests. No matter what niche you're in, no matter what you're doing, if you're going to do product reviews, it has to be an authentic test where you put your hands on the product. The more you can develop some sort of consistent process for, for testing and reviewing and, and covering that product, the better, as it's just going to make your content over time more consistent um, and easier for you to do your process uh, as objectively as possible. And so I know that's kind of a aggravating answer, I, I imagine, for a lot of you know listeners that are... That, you know, have a site that is, was built, you know, sort of in, in a different way. But I, as far as, you know, looking at product reviews in the future and, and how, like the, the level of quality, not only Google expects, but that consumers expect, like if you're going to, you know, you know, buy, buy a new smartwatch and you're, you're looking at the reviews, how many seconds does it take you to realize this person didn't really test the product? I mean, 10, yeah, uh, if, if that, and so, Consumers, I think, expect more out of a review than than ever before, um, both in terms of the way you structure your tests, the way you write your contextual, the way you take your photographs, the way you take your videos. The, the videos that we had that did tremendously well in 2016 and 2017 would be laughably bad uh, by today's standards. I mean, even sitting here, here in this podcast, you know, I've got my studio lights, I've got the tripod. You know, we tried to set up, you know, a decent backdrop, even though we're, we're on the road here. But the, the people rightly so expect a tremendously high level of quality. So I think that is perhaps the, the easiest benchmark to ask yourself. It's just like, would, would you want to read this review? Would you find this review helpful? And if the answer is no, then I think you need to go back to the drawing board and then build something that 
that would be helpful that, that, that you genuinely yourself would use. Yeah, maybe Google is going to call you up for that like, for, to like represent them for the helpful comment. Day. But I agree. It's like, I agree. It's like what I, tell, I try to tell people is more like try to respect people's time. Like, you know, it's like everybody's busy. Everybody's like has a million pieces of content they could consume at this, po at this point. They're choosing to click on yours. And if you don't respect them, they will not respect you, basically. Like it's, it's that simple. Yep. And, uh, and so like it's also about like, you know, how quickly the data is available on the page, the way the page is laid out. Like, you know, for example, you have this kind of like top header on your single reviews with all the scores, et cetera. So people get to get a quick glance at that. And they also see original photos that you've taken so that it tells them quickly like, oh, he has had access to that, et cetera. So like, it's not just doing the testing. If you do the testing and you have a wall of text and then it's like, you know, the photos are buried at the bottom of the page or something, it's also a problem. So I think the idea of like respecting people's time is like, uh, for me has uh, helped me explain to people what they should try to do on their site basically yeah i think you're i think you're absolutely right you know front loading your your biggest and and best stuff you know it's and it's a little sort of in contrast to i think historically or like in the way like videos are structured like the good stuff is at the end which you know is its own little set of you know algorithmic principles and it's a little bit different but when it comes watching, to contextual yeah. reviews like they need to know that what's on the page, like th that their needs are going to be met immediately. And if they get more than one scroll down and have not seen, you know, some real meat, they're not going to take the time to, to read through the rest of it. So, you know, we've really tried to structure our pages so that, you know, you really could just look at the top, you know, a thousand pixels or so, and you could end there. And that would still give you a, a ton of information to make an informed decision. And if you kind of want to you know, see our, our homework, if you will, you know, you can scroll on the page and we go, you know, super in depth on everything. Yeah. So when I look at Modern Castle and NapLab, they have, you know, the idea is similar, right? This this quantitative scoring and testing products, etc. The strategies are quite similar, etc. Obviously, I think Modern Castle is a bit more like it's an earlier site, right? It's like that's how it works. You build a site, then three years later, you're like, what was I thinking? Uh, it's like it's, it's that when I build sites, it's always like that, right? So I imagine it's like when sites age, you tend to like not look favorably upon them. Um, and, and it's quite interesting to see that on one side, Modern Castle has had all these ups and downs and then NapLab now is like on that fucking rocket ship trajectory doing really, really well, which honestly well-deserved. Um, Thank you. Like, why do you think that is? I know we touched on this a little bit, but do you think like what was fundamentally different between these two sides apart from the testing? And do you think that is the difference maker? I, I think there, there are a number of different makers. So I think while the trajectory of NapLab is, you know, rocket ship it's still relative to modern castle in terms of total traffic you know about half the size a third of the size um i think it will absolutely eclipse you know modern castle just by virtue of the the size of the industry there's just you know like more people looking for mattress review content than necessarily you know vacuums and robots so i think part of it is a bit of a misnomer to to that end yeah i think the the other major part is is focus and i think this is something that we've had to learn and relearn and hopefully learn for the last time on modern castle is just how essential it is if you're a small and mid-sized reviewer to be laser focused on the topics that that you cover and so we can't review every product on modern castle there's just there's not enough time there's not enough ability for us to really get the, the data and the testing at the level that it needs to be done to create the level of quality that's required. And so for us, we have, you know, really pared down the number of categories we focused on. I think, you know, at the, in 2021, we were doing probably upwards of like a dozen different categories and we have pared those down to really just six. Uh, occasionally we'll do a few one-offs here and there, but for the most part, we are really focused on just six core categories and most of those categories have a high degree of, of overlap in, in the type of test and how we're testing and I, and with nap lab it's even more extreme it is just mattresses Important. you know in the future we may expand out to you know pillows or bedding some of these others that are you know highly related but i think being laser focused allows you to just take your 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 review craft to to the next level um, also from a consumer standpoint, it just makes the navigation of a site that they might not otherwise be familiar with just that much easier. They, they know everything there is about 
mattresses if, or on Modern Castle. If they hit our, you know, robot vacuum or vacuum, you know, top level pages, they have this huge library of data. They don't have to go, you know, searching around. And from a searching perspective, you know, they see all of the, these pages. You know, they see, oh, he's, he's reviewed 100 robots. He's reviewed 50 cordless vacuums. Uh, and they know that, okay, there is at least some level of trust we can have with the site because we see they really do have this this content and they do have these tests. Yeah, I agree. Uh, basically, you recommend people niching down. You recommend like, hey, don't try to do many things, just do one thing properly. So are you like a proponent of like micro niche sites? Like in your case, you're focusing on metrics, which is a big category. Don't you think sometimes one category is too small? Like how, how do you go about that? That, I mean, definitely. Um, and I think that category needs to think, be, be big enough that you can sort of hit a critical mass and then continue to, to go down the road. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think mattresses are big enough. There's, there's enough mattresses. There's always new brands coming out, new models coming out from existing brands. You know, models are being refreshed. So there's just so much to do on that site. Every time I think, are we getting to the end? There's just, there's, there's still at least another like 200 mattresses sort of like on my sort of imminent radar that I want to test and review. Whereas I think Modern Castle is kind of a good example on the other end of the spectrum where I don't know that like vacuums by itself was ever big enough. It's close, but the reason when I started Modern Castle, I had the idea like, oh, I want to have sort of, you know, this to be more the home in general so that we can try some of these other categories out. And so, you know, vacuums, robots, air purifiers, they're they're similar they all clean stuff but they're you know different enough that you know we have you know different silos we can kind of go down and there's, and there's plenty of products in each of those categories and new products that are always coming out in those categories so it allows us to to keep expanding keep growing and, and keep covering the things that our readers are most interested in yeah i think the fact also that the mattress category it's by far one of the highest paying affiliate categories like it's like I know a lot of people who work in this industry and it's, it's top three niches for a lot of people in terms of like gross effort revenue. Whereas on Modern Castle, you had, you were mostly recommending Amazon, weren't you? Or like you are recommending, yeah. So like yes, the, the I think payouts we're, we're are probably still, quite different, right? Yeah, we're, we're still mostly Amazon. Um, you know, we, we've definitely tried to expand into, you know, going it's to hard, the right? site whenever possible, but absolutely <laughs> it's, it's tough because Amazon is, is easy. They almost always have the product. It's almost always the best price. And it's almost always where consumers would prefer to purchase it from. So at some level, like if it's sold on Amazon, we're going to have an Amazon link. And then ideally we'll have a link to uh, another, you know, retailer or director of the brand as well. But uh, it's definitely, I think with any type of product that is relatively inexpensive, let's say, you know, less than 500, less than a thousand dollars, I found that, you know, consumers generally would prefer to purchase that from Amazon. Yeah, they're like, they trust it in case they need to return it or something, basically. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and the conversion rate for us has always been like three, four, five, six X, whatever it's been to somewhere else. And so even though the commission rate were lower, it's like the total revenue was higher. Um, so it's like, even though they slashed the commission rates in 2020, I think uh, it still did quite well. Um, anyway, yeah, sorry, you wanted to tell something on Amazon? No, no, just, to, yeah, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's hard to not have them. I mean, again, consumers want them. Yeah. It's, I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, I agree. Conversion rate makes Amazon FA program a, a good program. Uh, I see one difference between Modern Castle and NapLab is that on NapLab, you're releasing a, a lot more informational content, uh, much more than you did on, on Modern Castle. Like you have like guides on sleep and like, uh, I think I saw this, um, Fiber, like um, optical, like fi fiber, fiberglass inside mattresses. That's the one. That mm, I oh, but yeah, there. that's a fun one. Why did you change the strategy from one side to another? Uh, what, what was the reason for that? I don't really feel like I changed strategies that much, but you're, you are absolutely right. There's far more of that on Nap Lab than on Modern Castle. Modern Castle and all of my sort of research to try to f find those informational, educational pieces about vacuums, robots, air purifiers. There's just not nearly as much interest and volume around that as there were on on the on the sort of nap lab and sleep and mattress side of things, and so we you know identified the ones the pieces that I thought you know consumers would be the most interested in, and we and we wrote those. But you know we definitely weren't going to write stuff that felt like it didn't have you know much interest, and so I think part of that is just the. The difference in you know sort of the way those industries you know go you know people don't do a whole lot of research like oh what's 
what's the best way to vacuum your carpet? And eh, people, you know, generally have, <laughs> have a good idea. And so we It's like, we what am I going to do on Sunday? Let me research that, you know? Exactly. Whereas, you know, if you're not sleeping well, then you're going to do everything you can to try to like figure out, you know, That's okay, what, what can I do better? What's not, what should I do with my bed? What should I do with my foundation? What should I do with my mattress? And so, um, but I, I do agree. I think it is an area where, you know, Modern Castle could and probably should have some expanded content on some of those areas. And, uh, but at the same time, there's just not as much interest. Yeah. Okay. Cause there's a big movement right now in the SEO industry called like the topical authority, basically, which basically for people is like, Cover all the topics and you'll rank for everything. The very, very, the very brief version of that is that, but, it's, but it means people are trying to um, to not just write about keywords that make them money uh, in an effort to be seen as an authority on the topic by Google, which makes them more likely to rank you up for these things. And so, yeah. like I was wondering, like how that falls into into that. Like, have you been influenced by that? Do you believe in that? Like, how do you feel about that? So yeah, it's one of the things where I really don't know how this became a thing the, the whole idea of topical authority yeah. uh, in my mind it's it's always been this way if you were going to have a website on any particular topic you needed to cover everything about that topic and so i've i've, I've read some of the stuff and i've seen some of your you know your, your podcast guests talk about this and i guess I, i'm just sort of confused at how this is any different than the approach that really has always kind of been the, the same way with building any sort of, you know, niche based website, you know, you, you always have needed to fully research, understand and have pages that are relevant to the things that you're yeah. writing about and to the things within your industry. Yeah. And I think if you write for more content, you tend to rank more for stuff. But I think the one of the problem that uh, I have with topical authority is that people like basically increase the size of their site by producing more pages. Um, but they don't necessarily produce pages that move their business forward. Like they, mm -hmm. they write for like trivial questions, like, you know, like, uh, what's the difference between, I mean, not even that, but like, uh, I, I can't really come up with an idea for mattresses, but like, you know, like even like what's, I, I, I guess like a mattress size, uh, guide is, is useful actually, but like, I don't know, like, uh, what's the production process of a mattress or something? Let's imagine like pure manufacturing or something, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. um, it's like, like, how is that, how is that helping your business? And it's like, um, my, my, what I'm a bit annoyed at is like, people like to show beautiful graphs of like site going up, but it doesn't mean the revenue is going up. And I feel like sometimes they'd be better writing better reviews or writing better, like, you know what I mean? Like actually yeah. making fewer pages, but better ones. Um, and I feel like while maybe the initial people who care with topical authority did not intend that, that is kind of like a side effect of people trying to chase that. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. And I think this comes down to, you know, you, you need to, I think, whether when you're, when you're writing like a review, you know, it's the review, the comparisons and the best of list. Like these are the, the pages that people are going to come in. They're going to read. They're going to ideally like what they've read, click your link and go out and make a purchase. Um, for a product that like makes sense for them. Whereas, you know, a product that's like, oh, should I vacuum in lines or at 35 degree angles? It's interesting. It may be some search volume there, but you're, you're right. It's not going to probably move the needle. The only way that a page like that moves the needle is if somebody comes and then sees, oh, he has this, all this other cool stuff. I'm going to read his reviews uh, or they like, you know, file you away uh, in, in the future. Um, so, but as far as, you know, that page helping to your other pages rank, I think there's yeah. probably some truth to it uh, in, in the just the idea of, you know, as, as sites get bigger, you have more collective domain authority. But at the same time, I think you, you made a perfect point. If you are so focused on that type of content and these sort of like easy wins that don't really move the needle for like the critical stuff, like well, 10,000 pages on of those is not going to make your reviews better. It's not going to make the the experience, the authority, the trust of you know the really critical pages on the site better. So if you can do both well, do both. But if you have to do one, just be an amazing product reviewer. That's the thing. It's like being a small publisher is like a constant struggle for resources. So it's not like 
when you choose to do something, you're not saying no to something else. You are absolutely saying no to something else. You can't do everything, right? Otherwise, you're going to yeah. do every home category on Modern Castle, right? It's like if you could do everything perfectly and it wouldn't probably cost any, I mean, it would cost you anything else on any other process, then you'd probably do it. The problem is that we all are strapped for resources, at least compared to the biggest competitors. And uh, you, your job is to use what you have in the most efficient way possible to like, start to outperform people with more resources, basically, and essentially economically outsmart them so that some things become viable to you that are not viable to them. And so therefore you can create a space where you can exist as a business and make some money, basically. Uh, and it's like, I just feel like quite often the way people look at this is is a massive distraction. That's my opinion, personally. Yeah, I, I, I think I think you're you're absolutely right. I, I wouldn't let that derail, you know, the, the the core of the business. And if your business is a product reviewer, you're the thing you need to be amazing be at. Good at it, is, yeah, exactly. Is reviews, and if you're not yet amazing at it, you know, you, then no you have point, more work yeah. to do there. I mean, like I said, right now we're we're working on sort of retesting everything on Modern Castle. Like my entire team is like focused around new tests, new photos, new data, and, and rewriting our old content to, to bring it up to this this level because the, that's what, what consumers expect. They they want the absolute best data, the highest quality review. And and the reviews that we were, you know, writing, you know, one, two, three, four years ago are just unacceptable now. And so it, it's up to <laughs> yeah. us to to rise to the level that uh, our our readers expect us to be at. Yeah. Uh, talking about topical authority and picking random topics, I was going around NapLab and I found one of your pages that is, how long do snails sleep? Uh, is that <laughs> a keyword you still pick today? <laughs> uh, pro probably not. Probably not. I think I think we came up with that one during our sort of initial sort of like ideation uh -huh. stage and keyword research stage. We're just trying to figure out, okay, well, we, we want to launch with, you know, 50 reviews and, you know, 50 sort of educational informational pages. Okay, well, what should it be? Well, this one's got good volume and it's related. Yeah, we probably should have done that. But, uh, but hey, yeah. it's, it's, it's ranking well. I think we're number one. We've got like a really nice... Yeah, that's one of your best pages, thing. actually. Yes. <laughs> that's <laughs> the thing. It's like, we all have that. Like, we all have that on our sites. Like, say, if you check some of our sites, like, you will find some ridiculous pages. Like, again, it's the same as like reviewing your content later. You like... Uh, you think it was a good idea at the time, then you check it three years later and you're like, what was I thinking? We we had we have a similar page on Modern Castle. I think it's called uh, "What is dust made of?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, a vacuum should move dust." So let's let's do a dust article, and I, I, we're not we're not not ranking as well for that one, at least not right now. But we historically we did well, and uh, it's, it's that's another one of those where we're it's interesting, it drives traffic, but uh, yeah, it's it's probably not one we would make again. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I mean, yeah, and that's that's what I'm trying to tell to topical authority people is like, yeah, the, the principle is probably good, but like, don't write too many of these posts. We have some of our side on our sites. You have some on your side, but try to not put most of your energy in that because that's not really driving a business. And talking about these kind of pages, like, you don't monetize your info content at all, do you? Uh, no, you know, we, no, I, I've you know done a, a testing for basically eighteen months on Modern Castle where we did. You know, a lot of, you know, display ads and programmatic ads and they, you know, definitely there was some level of success, success there. I shouldn't say that. The the ads did great. We, we made a, you know, a good amount of, you know, you know, revenue on those, but we were losing at, at least as much as we were gaining just okay. as far as, you know, we were driving people to click an ad instead of, you know, click on, you know, the affiliate link. And so we made the decision to drop those uh, at the time we were also seeing, you know, really just increasingly negative user experience and the ads we're running were just way too aggressive. Uh, so at least for, for my, my sites, I've just found that they just become a distraction and we just need to focus on again, like what is it that we're trying to deliver better than anybody else? It's, you know, reviews, comparisons, and best sub content. And we can't do that if people are distracted by ads or ads for slowing the page down or they're creating negative user experience. And so we made a decision basically to just drop all of those and again, just focus on the, the singular thing that we think we can do better than anybody else. Yeah, that's quite interesting because like the common wisdom in the industry is that ads tend to not drop the click-through rate for affiliate reviews. So it's quite interesting that, that you've said that. Was it a big drop? Um, I mean, it was, it was basically one-to-one, -one, you know, when 
I looked at all the data, basically, after 18 months of data on Modern Castle, it was essentially a one-to-one -one decline for, you know, every dollar we came on display, we were losing yeah, okay. over here. Now, I, I should say, at the same time, we were dealing with, you know, increasing sort of, you know, ranking volatility. And I, I think one of the major factors in that is the, the user experience declined to such a point. And I think Google saw so many ads on the page that they were like, oh, well, we don't like this site as much. And so we took a major hit. I think it was may 2020 and, and the core update and it just we plummeted and so we we had already pivoted by that point and dropped ads months earlier site-wide but i still think you know google had in their recent memory that they didn't like what we were doing so we continued that direction and we were able to to recover in the subsequent september uh, core update in 2020 i believe so and after we read the ads you went track. back up yeah now, okay, there, again, so there, 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 there's so many factors at, at play, you know, constantly. It's, it's, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, like, with 100% certainty yeah, that the yes. ads were the, the primary reason or that their removal was the primary reason for recovery, but I am 80% sure that, uh, you know, they were the, the biggest factor in, in those declines. Okay, that's super interesting because, like, one of the suspicions of the recent helpful content update that's dropped so many sites is how aggressive the ads are. Like, people with very aggressive ad layouts. So, like... I'll tell you, I have like one of our members who messaged me with his site and he has like super legit site. He's like a travel blog, but like, you know, he has photos of every place and like he has photos of the tickets when he tries a train or something like everything. You're like, it's done Absolutely. properly, basically. And uh, still got slammed by the update, despite the fact that he's doing like pretty good content. Like the only wrong thing I could find about his site was the super aggressive ad layout, like, you know, media vine type stuff, like ads everywhere, yeah. like autoplay videos sticking to the top of your mobile plus like a sticky bar at the bottom and the content is like squeezed in between and you're just scrolling like this because that's all you have left on your screen. Yeah. Um, so that's what, um, that's the only thing that I could find wrong. And it's like, it's, it's interesting to see sites like that because you know, people on social media like to like take a really shitty site and be like, ah, oh, look, that's why you got penalized by Google, etc. But like, it's more interesting to look at the actual decent sites that got hit because you get to isolate um, that stuff better. But it's quite interesting, your story about ads, actually. It's unfortunate, I think, that smaller and mid-sized sites really are held at this high usability standard, whereas, you know, the, the, the biggest media sites can do whatever they want. They plaster ads on everything. Their page feeds are garbage. You know, <laughs> yeah. that, that doesn't matter. Are you talking they about Forbes still, right now? <laughs> they can be talking about anybody. But yes, Forbes. Yeah, yeah Forbes. <laughs> yeah. They are, you know, particularly egregious in this area. I know. I, uh, we, I mean, we interviewed. They do a good job on the editorial. It's like they actually put quite a bit of effort in the editorial. Not as good as you. Not nearly as good on the testing. It's like, I don't think they should outrank you. Um, but like they do a better job than many affiliates as well, uh, despite that. Um, yeah. one, one thing is you're the author of every post on NapLab. Is, do you really write everything or, or is there a team behind? Uh, so we really are a, a team in NapLab. So there are a, uh, basically I've got three people on Modern Castle and three people on, on NapLab. And so we, we write, research, test, edit as a team. So these things are going you know, between different team members to, to, to get in different pieces of, you know, each particular piece of content. Um, but as far as, you know, publishing, like nothing gets published on Modern Castle before I have put in my, my final uh, edits, analysis, and, and, and comments into that page. And so um, it's, I've kind of debated on this, like, you know, I am still, you know, I think like the, the primary voice um and an editorial opinion on every article and still write a large portion of every article um however we do have a team and so i've sort of like debated like should we have multiple authors to indicate you know that there are multiple people you know contributed to this I, i've seen some sites do it and i've seen you know sort of you know, different you know case studies and opinions on this but it's kind of an area that i'm currently debating on but um okay as far as you know the, the final analysis to make sure that like i put you know, my my stamp on it, like, okay, I agree with what we've said here. This is accurate, or this needs to change. This needs to be more clear to make sure that, you know, everything that we're publishing is something that I, you know, agree with and I can stand behind. Yeah, it's kind of like Brian Dean as well. He walks the same way. He kind of like goes over every single piece that goes live on the site. And, you know, when I asked him, I was like, so you still didn't replace your editorial role? And he was like, no, it's like, I, I, it's the last thing. I, I can't let it go, basically. Um, yeah. So I it's, it's difficult, right? I don't. I don't know how to let it go either. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, it's. It, I think this is you know one of the challenges as you, as you get into you know 
it becoming a little bit of a larger site. And uh, as we've like grown up a team around us and, you know, different people do specialize in different areas of the content is finding a way to, you know, let go, you know, in the beginning, it was, it was just me doing 100% of everything, but, you know, to create the, the type of content and the quality of the reviews and the quality of tests and videos, there's just no way, like we, we have to have a team that, you know, individuals you know, support different sections of, of the content if we want to be able to do this at, at any sort of scale and, and maintain our quality level. Yeah, it's like I'm actually trying to do that on Autoy Hacker right now. It's like we have a full time editor who has like built and sold sites and everything and done all, like has a real life experience, but I still can't fully let it go. I have to like, you know, I have like a dashboard on Notion where I see stuff pass by. <laughs> I'm just kind of like quickly jumping in, dropping comments, etc. And I, I see how hard it can be to. Like if you care about your content, it's quite difficult to to let these things go. It's usually the last role that you you let go. Like you'd rather let go other things than than that, basically. Yeah, I, I can let go of everything except for the final QA. <laughs> I still I still want to be involved there. Yeah. So one thing that's interesting is like you're doing pretty good, um, but you don't necessarily have a particularly strong authority in terms of backlink to both NapLab, which is DR thirty four on Ahrefs, and Bolden Castle, which is DR fifty two on Ahrefs. Uh, what do you do any link building like do you do any of that or are you just like no i'm just gonna make a good site and that's good enough yeah i mean we definitely we have you know efforts where we're trying to actively attract links so um we we do that on both sites and mostly we're, we're trying to create content and, and pages or you know guides or infographics that we think are more likely to attract links and then we you know do outreach for those pages but it's uh it's 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 tough i mean there's i mean yeah right what what, what a what a revelation here Link building is tough, guys. <laughs> I think it's definitely the, the weakest area of sort of my toolkit and my skill set. Um, we're really good at creating content um, and not really good at attracting links to it, but we we do sort of as as, as well as we can. And you know, ultimately, I've, we've tried to spend more of our time focused on creating stuff than necessarily like trying to like outreach because we're amazing at creating. We're not as amazing at outreach. And at least in my experience, I found that the links generally solve themselves because with enough quality content and enough time, you're going to get those links. You're going to get that interest. And so we don't, I don't get too um, concerned about, you know, our, our, our relatively low DR. And um, at the end of the day, I, you know, we, we still rank well, um, yeah, yeah. given that Modern Castle or given that NapLab is barely two years old. And it's already, you know, competing for really competitive standalone comparison and best of it. It, it should be. It just should be. The only reason it is, is I think our content is just ridiculously high level and better than most other things out there. And so it naturally, I think, attracts, you know, links from, you know, the consumers and the readers there are consuming that content. Yeah. One thing that I saw is like a lot of people are selling your original images um, and, uh, and hot linking to you. Uh, I would uh, hit these people and just tell, tell them that these images are copyrighted and just they can use it, but they link back to you. Uh, if anything, I would make my images easy to steal and then just reach out to people basically uh, from a legal point of view, be like, look, if you're using my images, it's on your site right now. Uh, I have proof of that. But if you just, if you link back to me, it's fine. Like, and I'll write it in email. So you're fine legally, something like that. Like you can, um, like there are tools actually that allow you to find like much better than Google images. Can't remember. I put put the links in the show notes or something. Uh, I'll send them to you as well. But there are tools that allow you to find every single site on the internet that uses your images. And I think um, given the That's amount of content you're creating, uh, you have an opportunity here of link locomation. And it's like, just make your images easy to still almost put like an embed link or something or like, uh, just, just, yeah, just make it easy. Don't put the, um, the hot linking, um, there's a hot linking protection in Cloudflare that you could prevent people to do that. Don't turn that on. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and then just go and find all these people and just have them link back to you, provide, do you like the site? That's an interesting idea. I've occasionally received, you know, really aggressively worded, uh, exactly. legal letters. Exactly. You could be that guy, you know? You could be yeah. that guy. Yeah. <laughs> God, I don't, well, I don't no, hate to be like that you, guy, Gail, but, uh, yeah. You could no, make that's... library of images of products. Like a lot of affiliate marketers don't have that. You could make images they can use in exchange for a link on their page, you know? Like, that's true. We have we have a ton of images. We we take an excessive number of images for every product exactly. we review. Everything you don't um, use or something like maybe you just want to create a page of like, hey, you want some free product images? Go and grab them here. Um, it's like uh, 
help all these shady affiliate marketers make their sites look more legit <laughs> in exchange for backlinks, you know? Uh, I don't oh, know. It's like, it depends on your ethics, you know? You tell me. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 all, all your listeners are going to be reviewing Dyson products with Miami. <laughs> like we got this straight from yeah. Gale. Perfect, perfect recommendation. <laughs> I mean, you know what? You, you do what you want. It's just like free, 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 free tips, you know? I see you on social media as well. Um, you're on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, etc. You're not exactly big on social media at this point, but you're putting the effort. Like why? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, um, sort of ex excluding YouTube. I think YouTube is its own beast. I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. But as far as like the yeah. other social platforms, you know, I know we need to be there. We need to be active. We need to be better than we are. But it's one of those things where kind of like link building, we have a, a finite number uh, of time and, and money and resources. And if there's a way we can improve our, our reviews, like that's what we're going to like focus on. So um, I've just not put as much time and money into it, though. I, I do agree. It's an area that we, we need to do more of and we are, um, actively working on sort of a, a more aggressive like test campaign so um we're going to kind of dive in with some a uh, big series of social short videos for both modern castle and nap lab and so we're trying to develop a way that we can take some of our existing content slice it up into you know a number of short videos and then we're going to run those out for several months and and see how it does i'm i'm cautiously optimistic but you know I think social media is its own sort of, you know, separate world. And it is. we are unfortunately kind of in a hyper boring social media space, like mattresses, vacuums and reviews. Like these are not things <laughs> that people on Twitter are particularly interested in. So I've, I've historically found social media to be sort of challenging. Like we, I will answer any question that comes up on, on any platform as long as we're on there. So that's why we try to have like at least an active presence. But at the same time, I'm not too worried about our lack of presence there because most people just, they, they don't want to follow a mattress reviewer or a vacuum reviewer. And so fair enough. YouTube, I think is, is a totally different, different world. Um, it's just become so huge and so essential and so, expected of sort of you know anybody that's doing product reviews like they expect a, a super high quality high production value uh video review to go along with the contextual and so every sort of major product that we test to do a contextual for we try to do a companion video because it's, it's expected uh and then youtube has you know even though you know we do get a good number of views just from people watching the embed on our contextual review the majority of our views are still from, you know, YouTube's, you know, suggestions in, in the search engine there. So YouTube in its own right is, you know, every bit the search engine that, that Google is. And for many, you know, industries and, and types of consumer and demographics, like it is the first place they're going to look. They're not going to look to Google. They're going to see that video first. So I think of YouTube as being just as essential um, to our to our work as anything that we do on either website. Yeah, I think like when you get to that level of, getting the product in hand, creating the photos, et cetera, like not making the YouTube video feels like a waste of it. Uh, yeah. it, it, it would feel like, yeah, it's, so it's like, it's almost like when you want to be that legit reviewer, you are running a YouTube channel as well. Like you, you have to, um, and it, I think it enhances your time on page as well. Like people do like you, you embed the videos on top of the page, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And people watch it and then they stay longer and then it's a good signal for Google basically. And the YouTube videos rank on Google now. I guess for a lot of your review keywords, there's like lots of videos in the results. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a total no brainer. I mean, for for all the reasons that, that you mentioned, it's uh, it's just you just have to. Yeah, I agree. It's like uh, it's YouTube's be is not even social media anymore. It's kind of like just an extension, uh, yeah, of of your site. Uh, I agree. That's why we're doing like the podcast on YouTube, etc. I think it works well for us. And I think finding a way to be on YouTube with one or two formats, I think it's the same as content, right? You want to build your format and kind of reuse it because it's, it's difficult otherwise. Uh, I've done a lot of custom videos and it's like, oh my God, it takes forever. <laughs> um, but if you yeah. have a format, it's easier, you know? Yeah, we've become very um, formulaic for, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, just, just like on the websites, we have our, our contextual review, we have our comparison and we have our, our best stuff. Those are yeah. our, our three major ones. To, to, to the extreme that, you know, we use, you know, essentially the same shots and the same places with the same graphics and images. Not only is it sort of easier and faster to produce, but in the world of reviews, I feel like it is 
a better way to produce content because it's it's more consistent. So when you have uh, a viewer, you know, looking at several reviews, then they are always going to be able to find you know the same tests, the same information, the same uh, demonstrations uh, in in every video, and so it's just easier for them to you know get the comparative information that they're looking for. Yeah, and I think it's like when you get started on YouTube with your site, it's like don't try to be a YouTuber basically. Like treat it as like a complimentary thing. You know, don't chase yeah. the. The, the million subscribe, subscribers and the yeah. to play buttons, etc. Like, don't play that game. It's like, there's also a game for just like small content creators to create complementary content and just get their brand in front of some people and also get, enhance their site experience, basically. Yeah, it's it's tough on, on YouTube because you are surrounded by this and pantheon of like it, yeah. legends and you, you see the stuff they're doing. And I'm, I've always, you know, followed and been impressed by the work that, you know, Linus Tech Tips and, and MKBHD have done. MKBHD, and yeah, like, good. I, I look at that like, man, this is just incredible and so many views and, and how does he, how does he do it? And they're, but they're, they're so authentic and they're so intense and they're so um, just the, the sheer quantity of, of content yep. that they're able to produce. Um, and so, I try to emulate the things that I, I think that we can emulate and do well, but at the same time, um, you know, the Modern Castle YouTube channel has been going since 2017, and we have I think 33,000 subs, which is honestly it's a pretty good number for a, a vacuum reviewer. But <laughs> uh, at the same time, compared to you know the world of YouTube, it's it's nothing, and yeah. it's uh, but we we still do a, a good number of views, and it's again it's such an essential part of the overall review experience that uh, I, I would just encourage anyone to not be discouraged by, you know, not hitting like crazy view numbers or crazy subs, you know, they, those may come in time. I think just being, you know, consistently on the platform, creating, you know, video yeah, content exactly. that is high quality and, and sort of answers the same type of, of questions, has the same type of information that your contextual do will, you know, you know pay dividends over time. Yeah. Okay, so Glenn Aslop from um, Detail.com asked me to ask you this question, which is, what's your plan going forward? PR foldings, build more sites, more autos, lots more content, or just improve what you already have? Uh, and his first thought was, you could use some help with the design. <laughs> That's what he said, with the design <laughs> of the site. <laughs> yeah, no, ab ab he's absolutely right. So as far as our sort of media plan, I think we still have a lot of work to do on both NapLab and Modern Castle. I think in the, the immediate future, our, our primary focus is going to be on continuing to improve and expand both sites. So as we discussed a little bit earlier on, on the Modern Castle side, we really need to retest as much of our sort of, you know, legacy content as possible, the stuff that's still, you know, popular uh, and of, of interest um, and continue to aggressively expand sort of our, our core category. So we have just sort of finished rebuilding our whole testing process there. So we have a lot of work to to, to retest and, and rewrite uh, and then use all of that you know additional data to rebuild our comparisons and our best of pages. So um, NapLab is in um, I should, not really a similar position, but um, similar in that we have a, a lot of work to do and a lot of, of, of mattresses yet to review. So at least for you know the next couple of years, it's hard to imagine doing much of anything except, you know, standalone mattress review comparisons and best sub. Because, Spending your day in bed. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those those types of content, they're not the most exciting, but they are what our readers want to see. And there's still a, a, a lot of, you know, topical areas and products that we're, we're getting requests for that I know there's, there's interest in. So we have a lot of work to do there. You know, when we look, you know, five years down the road, you know, maybe we would uh, launch another site in a different uh, category. Who knows? Okay, cool. I like it. I like the focus on like doing one thing right. And it's like, I think that's a message the industry needs to hear right now. Uh, don't try to do too many things, do a few things right. Uh, and I think that's why you're doing well, actually. Yeah. That's 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 why you're kind of like standing out because you, you, you really laser focus on like doing these one content types really, really well. And uh, and so like yeah, it's like I saw your site the first time I, I got a modern castle. I was like, yep, this is different, you know. Uh, I used I think I used your uh, air purifier stuff for buying an air purifier actually, like uh, oh, nice. ionizer stuff for like uh, producing ozone and stuff. Like yeah, I've been reading about that actually. So yeah, it's quite it's yeah. like I don't really I don't very often use review sites to buy products, <laughs> but I've used modern castle. Uh, That's good. Okay, That's good. <laughs> Any final words of wisdom for the 
for the listeners? Um, I, I think for anybody that's that's thinking about you know doing product reviews, um, like like you said earlier, Gail, you it's better to to focus, be a master of one thing instead of a jack of all trades. There is just so much competition in the space, and particularly from these just giant media sites that if you aren't going to such an extreme level in terms of the, the quality of your content, you're just you're not going to break through. The only way to break through is to create something that nobody else can create, nobody else is willing to create, uh, and just focus on you know that, that one or two things that you can really do better than than anybody else. Uh, at least that's that's been you know my experience and in my career, it's been just hyper hyper focus and that's allowed us to, to break through in some, some pretty competitive spaces so that would be my i think my my biggest piece of sort of you know ending wisdom here cool well direct thanks for coming on the podcast and uh, i hope you had fun uh, i had a lot of fun discussing with you this is wonderful thank you thank you so much for having me on i really appreciate it no worries and thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you again for another podcast in two weeks if you enjoyed this video then check out this video where i show you how to implement eeat on your website in the most practical way possible these are the tips that several of our members have used to recover their sites from nasty google updates so check it out